who've been waiting for us as we made our way from a prior panel. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jason P. Harris uh, to the Dartmouth campus today. Um, as someone who uh, has a, a deep interest in expanding uh, the representation of uh, neurodiversity cultures mm -hmm. um, on campus and autistic culture on campus, uh, I'm, I'm just so glad that Jason could be mm -hmm. here um, and that we are able to commemorate uh, his talk so that it will reach a wider uh, group of interested people. Uh, Jason is the founder, spokesperson, and chief idea officer of Jason's Connection and a research associate at the Burton Black Institute of mm -hmm. Syracuse University. As a neurodiverse individual on the autism spectrum, Jason knows firsthand the challenges faced by individuals to find supports to assist them to live their lives in a way that meets their needs and goals. In 2013, he founded the nonprofit organization Jason's Connection, an online community for individuals with disabilities, mental health, aging, and diverse abilities and needs, providing information, resources, and art and personal experience blogs contributed by its online community. This site includes the largest national organic and searchable resource directory developed by an individual with a disability. The site operates concurrently with an active Facebook page with over a quarter of a million community members, a Twitter and Instagram presence. In 2013, Jason earned his undergraduate degree from the College of Mount St. Joseph in Cincinnati, Ohio, and in 2018, attained an MS in Cultural Foundations of Education and a Certificate of Advanced Disability Studies from Syracuse University. Following graduation from Syracuse, in addition to heading Jason's Connection, Jason began working as a research associate, focusing on self-determination and supported decision-making mm -hmm. at the Burton Black Institute, an international disability rights and human justice think tank at Syracuse University. Jason speaks to groups across the country about hidden and invisible disabilities and the cultural and social impacts on the disability community. His speaking engagements include participation in a diverse panel speaking on disability representation in the graphic and film arts at Cincinnati's 2018 Over the Rhine International Film Festival, Real Abilities Film Festivals, and addressing staff and fellows on a very topic Q&A at the Respect Abilities Maryland office. Upon invitation from the CEO of Archie Comics, Jason consults on the accurate representation of a female character on the spectrum at Riverdale High. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, can, can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. Hi, um, I'm Jason. Thank you. I mean, a lot of the ideas I'm going to share have already been talked about a lot, but I, I've been in the pleasure of being able to uh, be somebody with from um, disability studies, be able to, and also just a person who watches and reads media to be able to think about these things and then be able to enact them with the chance of working with the company, with uh, Archie Comics. So. Um, one of the things I think is really important is how we talk about these characters and sort of being able to see representations of yourself, which I haven't always been able to see in autistic characters, but also in the way that we depict disabled characters in general. So some of this will go over comic books and sort of the way that comic books can be open to this or and other things. Some of this has to do with media in general and how some of these things are covered because a lot of these are about storytelling devices and character building and things that we that are good in general for how to build characters, but also disabled characters and in general autistic characters because especially within terms of diversity, we tend to, I, I'm overlooking some of the history of some of it, there tends to be a little bit of a gap in sort of how characters from diverse backgrounds are sort of talked about and even the intersection of that diversity as time goes on. So I mean, and, that, and I think, but also the progression of that and how that's been able to be built up and become uh, more authentic representations. I think that, uh, so I mean, so one of the things is, is you have to be very careful with this is that a lot of this is based off of 
stereotypes of what these characters are supposed to be, whether or what the group thinks about that. And generally, those stereotypes come from outside the group. And with stereotypes, it doesn't necessarily mean that those tendencies don't exist in people who have those, who are with those identities. But when it becomes stereotypical, it tends to be the way that those characters are represented throughout different mediums and time and spaces. So it becomes a way to non-verbally signify that that character may be or may, may be or may want you to think about it or they're going to identify that character with a certain positionality of space. And so with autistic people, there tends to be uh, some, in disabled people, there tends to be some very specific um, ways such as, uh, I mean, while the monotone, it tends to focus on males who tend to be so socially awkward, but that social awkwardness comes from internal instead of necessarily external forces. Um, they, it tends to be around the age from young, from young children to about mid-30s. It tends to be white. It, there tends to be a focus on for autistic characters being re taking things very literally without being able to have jokes or very obsessions with it with, that are the only sort of thing that they're interested in. And those things don't necessarily exist, but there, but there's also ways to talk about it that are more nuanced and more, especially as you're having the characters be more, as you're talking about characterizations of that. And also that that tends to be the only driving factor that defines a character who has a disability or disabled or who's autistic or who from any identity is that tends to be the thing that drives the character, the only thing that they relate to the world through. And, and people tend to be a little bit more complex than that. And, and so it tends to have one dimensional or two dimensional storytelling when you tend to have the only thing that's driving a story is just that sort of conflict of dis of they have a disability and that's the, and they have to overcome it or they have to find a way to deal with it which tends to be the mid which tends to be one of the tropes of storytelling around disability is that disability is either something to overcome or um, so, so one of the, so that's really important. I think that comic books have a really interesting way of as somebody who I really like comic books. I have for a long time. As somebody who who's interested in reading but not a very good long form reader and, and doesn't always visualize. It gives somebody. It gives me a way to be able to read a story and see the visuals and be able to interact with it in a way that I can't necessarily interact with a book and so so it's even though and I know there's a lot of people who really like books and they're really good form as well I think that it also has a that it can have a longer term format that gives it a lot of a lot of space to develop and foot out stories and build up characters and build up storylines and sort of things that make it so that that sort of longer form gives you a chance to be able to deal with stuff without having to try to tie in the whole identity of somebody in a single two hours or a single book or something that may be very that may be tough to be able to get at the nuances of a personal identity. Um, I think interesting too is how comic books can have multiverses and that gives you a lot of ways to be able to retell and redo and sort of introduce characters that and be able to also tinker with sort of character dynamics and who's involved, who's what, in what place. I think it's a it gives it a really good form of you like. Now comic books itself have not uh, been have not been ex not the, have also had trouble with problematic storytelling and problematic characters depictions but because of those things I think comic books tends to be and because of the audience tending to be people who are long-term over investment readers and tend to look for other things it tends to be if you I mean not with any empirical sort of knowledge but just sort of how I noticed you know, through different media relations it tends to be the one of the more progressive forms of telling stories because of that with generally movies being the least progressive form of telling stories because of the form time Lad and more and more because of movies becoming about just specific comic book sales where comic books can have niche markets and markets where it does really well, different stories that do really well. Like in, um, I, I think, so yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I, was really important to this was to get, is to see that a character 
is it, it's not also I mean and so one of it was not to have care not to have characters just necessarily being stereotypical but also look at the way that the characters are reflected in the environment around them in the way that people treat them in the way that they interact with them because we tend to see sort of disability stories as an internal one person sort of piece where these tend to be about a bigger thing about being part of communities and societies and how we interact and how people see what is what what's considered are disabled, how we interact with people, who we ostracize, who we don't, what we accept. And so I think that that was especially going into the area where I was able to go to with Archie Comics was a really big point because you were you were in a high school community where it was a, where the most of it where the character I was dealing with Scarwood was a completely new character and everybody else was established in a universe that might be different when dealing with, you know, with the character who where all the characters are being established because a lot of these things aren't necessarily rules they're more suggestions of guidelines how to do this to think about and to make sure that when you're doing it you're taking consult you're working with artists and and in consulting and having storytellers who are also through those identities just because i think as we see i know there's parts of the comic book world that are still very much white character white male characters only work but I think that we see more and more that these character storytellings as they're getting more diverse, having more people, having more positionalities is really important. I think that's another thing about having a disabled character, autistic character, is there's other identity things that come along with that, but, 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 for, but also for autistic characters, auti be, having an autistic identity rather as a sort of diagnosis identity was really, really important, I think really important and sort of a disability cultural identity that comes from the background of disability doesn't necessarily doesn't always necessarily mean everything's terrible or that this is bad there's a lot of people who take this as part of who they are as part is even advantageous to who they are and, and being able to show that sort of different dynamic and also sort of the influx of that where it can fluctuate where it's not always exactly 100 percent the same just as any but of our confidence can wane and and be Fervor, it becomes a dynamic part of how they build the self-identity of world and the self-identity of those around them and other people are able to do that as well. And so, uh, so part of that was making sure the, uh, the character was strongly autistic. It was knew that they were strongly autistic, took it as an identity, but also that there was other identities that could go along with that. And when so, um, and I can answer more about this. I'm, but some of the things that I was making sure, so when I got consulted with Archie, I thought it was a really good start with the character, something that was different. Some, some many autistic characters, again, being male, it was interesting to see that there was a female character that was, that was Filipina or Philippine X was really interesting. And obviously backgrounds that I don't possess myself, but from it, so I wasn't necessarily talking about those consistent stereotype points of when I was making those stories, but that was in consideration of the idea. And one of the first, so this character started before I uh, was on it. it. It had an introductory issue where it was to introduce her into the Archie universe. And it was, and it was a story because of that they wanted me to pass along because of the number of followers I have on Jason's, community members I have on Jason's connection. And so, again, I don't like to just talk. I really thought, well, this is an opportunity to be in a nice way, say, like, look, I think this is an interesting character, but there's some problematic elements of this character that don't get at the tone that you're trying to get at which is a high schooler who's tr who's about under who which the point of the what when we when the person when Nancy Silverclay who's the co-CEO of Archie sent it to me was about people understanding and accepting autism it was like well this doesn't necessarily go to that so part of that was being able to make suggestions and and some of that was because as, as understanding as it was the main story writer was a parent of somebody who is who is uh, who is autistic and probably somebody who is younger at that point than than the character of Scarlet was at that point. I mean, they seemed like they were a pretty young parent, and the Scarlet was about the age of uh, probably beginning high school, which is I mean there tends to be the stereotype and infantilization that 
that there, that autistic people tend to be a, the same throughout time and space, and that 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 the sort of this infantilization of disabled people in general. That you, but there, within the autistic community and uh, in the disability community, you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. There tends to be very different, you know. I mean, and again, one of the things is is you tend to see autistic people being math and science based, and Scarlett does have some of that based on her, but there's also other characteristics because I'm in no way great at math or science. But I mean, I still take some of those things that may be seen, I'm more, I mean, obviously in the social sciences. So it was taking that and also taking, and so then they sent me another issue. Sorry, I jump around a little bit. <laughs> but um, they sent me a second issue after that because they were glad, They were, it was really, it was, it, it's tough always to make suggestions to this because you get that the publishers are trying, especially in the sense, are trying, are not necessarily, well, most of the time, most people are not trying to do things to harm a community or be in this, but especially in this case, I understood that the point of this was to have a helpful representation, but you also gotta make sure that that, that representation is actually going to be something that's going to be useful. So I mean, it was I was glad that the person Nancy Silverclay was able to take it in stride, and I've been able to work on it. And um, another one they they sent me that they weren't able to use was about was about Scarlet, and that and again that was one where it was a little bit more in that was one where it was a little bit more infantilized. Because after I sent her the comment, she's like, "Oh, we have this other script that they already made." Because they, with the way that some of it works, which I didn't understand, which is really interesting, is they write it out first, and then they'll ink it later once it's finalized. So I was reading the sort of writing, and they'll put out notes and stuff. So I was reading sort of the thing, and it was about Scarlet, and she was, and it was sort of about this sort of like Special Olympics type day. And so part of the thing that I wanted to make sure is because the goal was to be friends is to, well, these seem like they're people to her who are more of her co, who, who are more working with her, more educators than they are peer groups in the same age because she seems like she's a little bit younger. Like they're having her have crayon time and snack time. And, and I get that this was really, and it was trying to do it. So I'm like, what, how, what happens if the activity is for everybody? And uh, and uh, um, and uh, um, and that it was more based on they were all doing the same things. They were all in the same class. You see, because I mean. And I think that was a suggestion that was well taken. It never f officially got published, but then the one that I just worked on, Flower Shoes, is the one that is, is out. It's not, all these are not in the main Archieverse at this point. They're in a subset of issues that are it because of some of the ways that they, the comic books run and things that are not necessarily because I more consult and talk to Nancy than I do really in with the whole Archie. Uh, gang the whole archie collective but um but so like it's a flower shoes which is a special issue which is a which is a singular issue that you can get online that i don't have the link for nancy silver quite does and there's a but um but it would so for some part of it was is again showing that these issues some of these things are about how taking sort of the things that so one of the things is she really wants flower shoes because she really likes flowers because she's really really interested in flowers and taking that idea of this is something taking the idea of obsession and flipping it on its head in some ways because she is really interested in it and it is something that's a driving force of the thing but it but it's not necessarily the only thing she's interested in as obsessions can be as it's interest of autistic people can be many different things and they can go in and out and be more complex and just that's the only thing somebody's interested in in any point or things are the only thing that drives them so in this case she was really interested but it was also explained what for, at the end of the story why she wanted those shoes because she liked the feel of being in nature it made her feel connected to it and she liked walking through flowers but also part of it was the main pro the main conflict of the story was that wasn't wasn't that uh, it wasn't necessarily that she was autistic or that, that that she was too obsessed about it it was that she couldn't buy them because she didn't have enough money so how to, would she be able to get the money with being able to get a job 
and stuff. And I think there was also, and so that sort of became in, and then sort of people teasing her a little bit, like Reggie, who tends to tease a little bit about her having to do that and her wondering, well, what does that mean? But also, in some ways, saying, look, Reggie, I'm doing it because of this, which I think takes that sort of maybe not always getting the social cues, but taking it instead of that she doesn't understand is she understands, but she's maybe wondering, well, what is exactly do you mean by this? So, I mean, I think there's a really, I've been able, I mean, it's been really interesting process to be able to work on. And I think it's been, and I mean, obviously for the future, I have more ideas for the character and I'd like to see the character be able to be in autistic spaces, be able to deal with spaces that don't always accept an autistic identity, but also deal with other things that go along with being a teenager and being relationships and things, but also even things that maybe, maybe coincide with being autistic, but not always like gender identity and sort of other things that are more complex and sort of also go with this idea of intersectionality and also other identities with the character, but I mean, that's more, but I'm not going to be more talking, I mean, I'm not in the positionality to be able to completely be able to talk about that, but I would hope that it, even being Philippine X and, and, and having some of the things or things that are explored with the character is sort of a dynamic character who's three-dimensional, who, who autistic people can relate to, but also people who are outside can have, can empathize with in some sense, but also realize that it's a particular betrayal. I don't know if that uh, is hopefully. Is there any questions or any? <laughs> yeah. Um, how, when, when, how did the Archie Comics folks first approach you? And, and what's the uh, work method that you have with them? What, what's the actual work process? Yeah. There? So they approached me through Jason's connection. They sent me the original transcript of the, the original comic, the special, the special edition to, to sort of introduce Scarlet. And so, uh, so we said, well, we'll put. We we mentioned putting it out there, but then we also, when we read it, said, look, we, we it's something we didn't do publicly, but we sent them back. Like we have these suggestions for this character to be able to be a more, to be able to fit what you're doing, but also have a more authentic representation of an autistic character that doesn't necessarily fill the strokes. Because again, authentic representations, part of authentic representations is, is that Scarlet shouldn't be, just that our model of the character shouldn't be the only model of an autistic character that's out there either. It's having diverse representations and, th and diverse ways that the characters interact with the world as well. So, so I mean, it, it would be, and then so we usually, they send me some ideas. We look over them. We say, this looks well. This looks like, this seems like something that you might want to fix when they, so they send me the, initial script of the story and then we tell them sort of what we're thinking would be good what it seems like could be problematic what could be switched and then and then they ink it and then we look over it again and then yeah and so there is a final review process you're part of where you yeah. see the ink pages and then whatever that version is that's what's going to see print yeah so you, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes can you uh, kind of speculate on when you say you don't want her to be the only model so let's say yeah. we introduce another character who's on the spectrum. How do you feel then that character would be differentiated from Scarlet? I mean, I think they can definitely have similarities. I mean, maybe somebody uses facilitated communication. Maybe somebody has different interests in what Scarlet does. So where she tends to have nature and she tends to be into blueprint schematics and other things, maybe they have different things. Maybe where she tends to be more boisterous and talkative, they tend to be a little bit shyer. I mean, it, it, some of it, it, some of it just how the characters themselves are and how you build a character in general. And But then also relating that with an autistic identity and some of those things in taking so that you can have traits that are that, that, that are that may that from the autistic community that are seen as autistic but they but are not always replicated in the same formulaic ideas yes hi uh, just out of curiosity um do you know about the musical we do open hansen i don't what do you do? i love musicals though so <laughs> oh, yeah i do do so speaking as a theater kid so there's this one main character in the show and his name is Evan Hansen. So basically, I don't want to like linger on too much and just because of the um, like time that we have left. And, but basically, yeah. he can be like socially awkward at times. Yeah. And you know, he, throughout most of high school into his senior year, he wasn't like that outgoing with the rest of the kids. Yeah. And sometimes every now and then, especially in the show, he would like stumble through the 
Susan through his words. So yeah. I've been wondering, just out of curiosity, if you think that Evan could also be like an inaccurate, another inaccurate representation of autism. Yeah, I mean, I think that it could be. I mean, I actually really I mean, I think it can. I think it can. I mean, the thing about inaccurate representations is, is it's, it, it, I mean, it's hard to say exactly 100% what's inaccurate and what's accurate because there's going to be somebody who relates it. It's sort of the idea that it sort of becomes a trope that sort of, I, that sort of makes the character one-dimensional and sort of is the only way of thinking about it. So, I, I mean, it sounds like very possibly the character could, especially based on what the social awkwardness is based on many autistic characters, social awkwardness comes from inside, that they just don't get it, they don't understand, which is not necessarily untrue, but also some of the social awkwardness is that there's a way society's built society, sociality that makes it so that if I'm in an autistic space, I'm not necessarily socially awkward because everybody agree, because we tend to have a similar idea of what we want sociality to be, which is more talking about ideas and less talking about some other things. So I mean, in some of the ways that I'm socially awkward is being reinforced by society, no, don't talk like that. So, I mean, it could be, yeah, it could t obviously, depending on why it is that they're socially awkward, is it just that's who they are and they're just only that way and that's based on the stereotype or is it, is there, is there more complex reasons and, and is there more exploring of those reasons? This might be related, Jason. Yeah. So do you, do you find yourself wanting to give suggestions not about Scarlet, but about the other characters in order to provide a more accurate representation? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the characters in the second issue, the one that I talked about with the skiing that never get, a lot of the suggestions were about the, there were some suggestions about Scarlet, but a lot of the characters were about Scarlet out, the characters outside of Scarlet, and why would they be doing that? Are they, if they're the same age, why are they talking to it? I mean, I mean, it's in relation to sort of how, but even with that, you know, you're wondering, or even with sort of like how, you I mean, you definitely have suggestions of how you do for the characters because again as, as an autistic person as a story writer is as, as a consultant some of the stuff is as I have obviously I'm coming in from my own view as an autistic person but I'm also looking at it as a media viewer as a reviewer as somebody who's going to be reading the comics and I think that we, we have to be careful to only put autistic people writing autistic people where it should be just autistic people are in these spaces in the writing room in the drawing room and with, with people because there's going to be things that they can bring to other characters as well. So, I mean, and, I, and that's where I hope that some of the things I do also expand to having more people with, with diverse backgrounds, including being autistic and other disabilities, as, as well as other positionalities, just in general in writing rooms and comic books contributing to characters. Yes. Oh, sorry, would you? Yeah, sorry, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, the, what, what you said about three-dimensional characters really resonated with me. Yeah. But I was curious about kind of the tension that that has with story and character because three-dimensional characters have flaws. Yeah. And conflict. And it sounds like in the description of Scarlet, there's a lot of strengths that I hear. Yeah. But what are her flaws? I mean, she definitely can be impulsive. I mean, you know, I mean, and some of that is still the character's building. So some of this is that, as you usually with some of the, I mean, from what I've seen from different story arts, you tend to sort of, when you build other characters first, you tend to sort of start out with the positives and sort of build that up. And then the characters, as they become more dimensional, become, become start, you, then you start seeing the flaws of the characters because some of the things that we're going to relate to and some of the things that the audience is going to want to see is some of the character's strengths. But with disabled characters, it tends to be the opposite sometimes, where you tend to start off with the flaws, and then you get into the hearts that make it. So I mean, I, de I definitely think there's flaws that are gonna that, that are a part of Scarlet. I mean, she she I mean, it, we can already see she can be a little bit too talkative of much, you know. I mean, and part of that's just who she is. Part of it's, I mean, but you know, I mean, maybe it's not always in the right places. But maybe that some of that is also that people see that as a flaw. That's a way to see that people who are autistic or people or women or people of color shouldn't be talking as much. So, I mean, some of this is going to be a dynamic process of how that interacts with the characters. But, I mean, yeah, totally, three-dimensional characters always have flaws. And, and I think that's a really good point. And you can see some of the best storytelling in the 20th century coming from relatable characters who do have flaws and, and even starting with that. Yes? Do you have any concern about the, the way that the 
this word is being used in such an expansive way. I mean, because literally anybody who's socially awkward and smart, people will say, oh, is that like on the spectrum? Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that if we, if, if we keep on increasing this, the, the definition, um, it sort of loses its meaning. So I wonder if, if you have thoughts about yeah, when, I mean, when to not call someone that. I mean, I definitely I mean, I think from a medical perspective, I think there's an interesting and I think there's a set base of things for I mean where I, I think that it can be confusing and I think you don't want to just tell any I mean I think there can be over diagnoses of many different things in sort of medical communities. From a cultural perspective, I think it's really up to the people and it's up to the community of autistic people to define what it is that is autistic culture and what it is to be autistic and, and who it is within the group and make sure to include the most number of autistic people without necessarily with, while still having an understanding of the parts of the culture that make it, what it is about you that you appreciate that you bring a commonality while understanding there's also differences so I mean I think there's a I mean I think medically there's a different answer than there's culturally which are which is more and more through the 21st century there's becoming more and more autistic culture becoming through as people are so I mean it's complex it's not necessarily one thing but it, but I can see where especially as a diagnosis it's tough to be able to 100% be able to have it so wide open yes this is so much based upon a previous question do you ever feel that there's a need to censor the extent of the depiction of autism and order to present it in a good light. So we were talking about flaws. Yeah. But there's also a difference between flaws and certain manifestations of disability mm -hmm. that sometimes can be very unappetizing to people that are not exposed in a comfortable or consistent way to people with disabilities. So do you find yourself censoring yourself and saying, no, I can't talk about this issue because it would look, make someone with autism look bad, or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I definitely think it's part of the things that you're thinking about and some of the things that you, how you're building a character and stuff, especially in this situation. But I would hope in the future that we're able to be able to talk about this more and be able to have more open discussions and understand why is it that we see it as this way or not. I mean, I think a lot of it, I mean, a lot of social right movement in general have been built on sort of hiding some of the negatives of it or putting that on another group and then saying, well, we're really like this and so I mean I think that can be problematic in its general and while you're trying to reaffirm and also I think you also want to keep pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable what's uh, what's what what can the character do what's going to be deemed as and that's you know so it's I mean that's sort of the question I mean what I do with Jason's connection and what I hope to do with the characters like that is to keep pushing the boundaries of what it is and I think being able to have that long over time as people get more and more established the characters you can push things a little bit Bit more and more and I think it should be I mean some of these things maybe not everybody is 100% ready for now but you can get them ready for it yeah so with that in mind um, can, I, can I ask you to imagine uh, a, would a version of an Archie comic book maybe or a, a kind of comic that you would uh, you would invent from the ground up yeah. Maybe, where, where you're starting with the characters, would you create uh, an Archie type world or would it be something totally different if your aim was to produce a comic that would be definitively contributing to what you're calling autistic cultures of the future? I mean, I think there's part of it that I take from an Archie world. I mean, I think for a lot of us, and I think especially for people where, where who get called out for marginalized identities, some of those areas of life are a big point of how they become form identity of who they are and sort of respect or uh, and sort of how they interact with part of who they are. So I think there's a point of high school that, since it's something that a lot of people go through, is definitely a commonality. I mean, I don't know if I would create it 100% the way that it was created, that it has been created, or that it, that it would make it so it was, that, or have the characters even more 
fleshed out or some of the things. But I mean, I, I'm not. But I'm not. But one of the things is I'm not a great. I'm not a great fictional artist. I'm more, most of my stuff is. So I wouldn't be great at write, writing a whole fictional world, anyways, just because that's not the way my particular set of skills work the way my brain works, I tend to be more looking at whatever people and being, oh, that's interesting and sort of things. But I mean, then I also can write, but I'm more of a uh, nonfiction and being able to write out sort of storylines more. So I mean, even with the story writing, I'm not writing the stories for Archie. I'm contributing to what they've already written to be how to write them. I mean, but I think there would definitely be a way that, I mean, if you're building this from the ground up, there would, there would definitely be steps that could be similar, it could be dissimilar. I mean, it could, it mean, and I think that's also where a multiverse is kind of cool because you could have a universe where there's, where some of these characters are in high school to explore some of that, but also some of it could be later in their lives, in the middle of their life or something, which is probably where I would start just because it's not as talked about for, for disabled people and general autistic people where we don't see some of those later dynamics and sort of things that I think, again, still people would be able to relate to as they've gotten older they, or they've seen in other mediums, but maybe a different time period just because it's not always covered. Sorry, hopefully that answered or... Just, um, I've been thinking about this, and I'm not sure it works as a question, but yeah, no, when, I, when I was teaching um, comics and also having my students draw comics, one of the things we kept talking about was this weird um, conflict, because drawing comics often relies on caricature and yeah. exaggeration. Yeah. But how do you use that yeah. in, and avoid inflicting it? Yeah. On a character, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I mean, because that can be a very, very negative thing yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. So, no, I think that's a really good meaning. You know, are you saying for visual style? Uh, or? Visual style, certainly. Yeah. You know, there's been a whole bunch of discussion about the visual style, and particularly racist caricature yeah. comics going way back. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about just any kind of caricature that is so inherent in comics. Yeah. But is also so much a way of distancing marginalizing, putting down. Yeah. And then you're working in a comic trying to introduce a marginal, a marginalized group's mm -hmm. perspective into the comic. What do you do? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think some of it is being aware of how that's going to be in trying to make sure that you're intentional with some of the things that you're doing with the character, how the character is represented or drawn or how the character sort of interacts and not necessarily ignoring that those exist, but trying to take what people think they know and taking it on a head. So, you know, I mean, I mean, and it may be something that, that the audience, and making it sometimes not, because some of the ways that you have caricatures is you tend to make things bigger and more pronounced. So some of the things like Scar like Scarlet didn't understand what Reggie meant. In a, in a way you would think, in a more traditional way of stereotypically telling somebody with autism, you would think she, she was wondering what Reggie meant by saying, what, what do you mean by that, Reggie? When, when more stereotypical, you would have played that out and had it more profound of like, what do you mean? I don't get like, you know, sort of in a way that shows that the incompetence is that she doesn't understand where this was more brief, where it was more nuanced wants and more like what do you mean making that she was trying to double check which I think is actually a lot of it so it's also making it less some of those features less pronounced in a sort of way that when you have tropes of characters those characteristics or those visual features tend to be more pronounced in a way because it's trying to point that out and say look at this or notice this in the storyline where when you're trying to make it more nuanced it can still exist but not necessarily be as big a deal to the story plot or structure or even just a line that sort of goes over. It's actually a good point where yeah. with certain types of identity they're visual so you can tell most of the time gender and race yeah. and with like sexuality and disability it has to be announced. Yeah. At the same time, announcement can come across as a little bit yeah. tasteless. So did you feel there was an announcement, a proper announcement? How was the identity introduced? Did it yeah, I mean, my it was kind of, yeah, and I think it was a, you know, and that was before, and I think that was one of the thing, but I mean, also it's how you say, I mean, we had one of the images we worked on said, we the neurodiverse, 
and, and sort of, and I was like, that sounds like we are legion, come many as we are one. <laughs> and, and, and so it's also about how we say, like, you say, like, you, like if you, so when we, when she's successfully announcing it from what we've done, it's a point of pride. This is who my identity is. This is who I am. I'm showing you who I am. Now that might be different in the, but that's not every time she's in the story. That was a specific time of like announcing identity. I mean, not every time scene she's in, she's like, I'm autistic. <laughs> she, but then is there ever a problem of maintenance? So once again, how many yeah. times does one's identity need to be announced in order to reinforce that? So you have issue one, she says I'm autistic. Yeah. Issue number two, she's not autistic anymore because she's not announcing it. Um, I mean, I think that we, I mean, I, I, that's a really good point. I think that there still tends to be things. I mean, we're not, you're never ignoring that the identity is that that person is autistic and that drives who they are. That's one of the reasons she wants the flower shoes is because she really, really likes flowers. And that's part of her personality is being autistic because she has a really good thing. And, you know, but it, it, it's about making the call outs not be so outlandishly like, Obviously, this person is autistic. Like this is stereotypical of what you would think is an autistic person, and, and sort of comical in the way that you're sort of standing out. Where it sort of it takes away from the storytelling that you're actually trying to do. Where it, because I think there's a point where if you're trying to make it too loud, then the actual story gets redone to make sure that you remind everybody that that the character is autistic. Where you want to have those reminders and things that may be people like, oh, those seems like something that I've seen with other people that I know who are autistic, but then I'll not also be so big red herrings that it, it, it's sort of comical in its way. You do have the problem too, though. You know, yeah. Like you're helping Archie. Yeah. You can't presume that the person who reads the fourth story with Scarlett ever saw the first one. Oh, that's you totally. Constantly, I mean, one of the, the limitations of the form in periodical comics is you're constantly having to reintroduce characters because yeah. you're hoping you're picking up new readers who've never seen <laughs> those characters. Well, and this is, so she's in her own series right now as a character as they're still working on it, so that hasn't, but I mean, again, I think some of those things is not that it won't ever come up again that she, and it won't ever be a part of the story plot of that it is, but it's not the only thing that's making the character, and it doesn't have to come up every issue that this is the thing that's driving it and then there'll be points where you can allude to it and people will still get this sort of especially as you have more and more stories that allude to it without telling it it will be like oh that seems like that but also get to know the story the character outside of necessarily that one plot device while still without that one characteristic while still being able to come back to it at every point because again it's not that that her autistic identity doesn't in some ways drive stories because being autistic Autistic is an identity of something that you do, and there's going to be, and there's going to be great things that come from it. There's going to be challenges that maybe come from internally or from external sources. It doesn't necessarily have to be. We're never going to talk about this again with this character. It's just being skillful with how you would use it with a bunch of different characters. I mean, it's like what's a superhero? I mean, different parts of a superhero identity or different parts of. Things there's some things that don't always have to be announced in every issue, but can, but they're still related. I mean, you don't talk about Peter Parker's job in every single issue, but we know Peter Parker at some point is a struggling person. Whether we get that from the first time we read it, or as we keep seeing themes around that, that becomes more and more part of the character, while still Spider-Man being a major part of identity as well. Um, I'd like to ask a question of you, Jason. Um, yeah. Are there common characters that you look back at? Yeah. And you go, well, that's that's a character that was never tagged as autistic because, and in some cases, the term didn't even exist at that mm -hmm. time. But clearly, you know, you you would recognize them as uh, being part of if you were putting together a, an essay charting, you know, comic history. These yeah. are the characters you would cite. And you know, I'm thinking. Even in comic, comical comics, like yeah. Harvey's character, Little yeah. Dot, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a character who was entirely defined by yeah. she loved dots. That was yeah. the whole modus operandi of Little Dot, you know? 
I mean, for, so I know there's people who, in the autistic culture, who definitely go back and say, especially in manga and other forms, they definitely do when they go to that character. I haven't watched as much manga, but for comic book characters, there's part of characters that I relate to. And looking back, I sort of like, I related a lot to Batman when I was younger. And I think a lot of the Batman things wasn't necessary, was more the, I've done it was more the societal like I thought it was a burden to society, and that Batman's whole point is he should have saved his parents, and he's put these people in peril, and I felt like I put people in peril because of the way my identity was. So I mean, there's definitely identity points of characters that I that looking back I definitely relate to, or even with Spider-Man, I see sort of that altruistic part of this sort of do best over what's best for society over what's for you is something that is part of my autistic identity, but also part of how I see those characters and why I relate to those characters. So, I mean, it's definitely a part of it. I don't necessarily do whole characters and stuff, but I, I know other people who do in the autistic culture, and there's people, and there's also characters that the creators later confirm are autistic because of that. I know there's one in a video game, I think it was one of those shooter, like, where people play together that, that, that later, everybody was like, that character's autistic, that so relates to my autistic identity. And then the person did go back and say, yeah, that person's autistic. Yeah. Is there any uh, other things? Hopefully this is all right. Thank you.